it's gotta be. All right. This is the Drew Spearians, the show that's 80% combat sports and 20% everything else. Today is 20% everything else. I am super honored with today's guest. He is a legend in his own way. He is a up-and-coming hockey player. He's played pro. He to be an NHL star in the future, so watch for his name. I am thrilled to have on Nikita Kovalev. Welcome, Nikita. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm I'm so excited. <laughs> you look exactly like your dad, man. You know that's it's, people are gonna say that. Gonna yeah, say I get I get that a lot already. So yeah, I'm used to it. Yeah. So uh, how has it been for you since uh, 2020? You know, uh, you had a pretty good year. You know, you you finished prep school, then you went to you went overseas for the first time. So what's uh, 2021 been like so far? Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of been a journey. Uh, it's, it's been tough. You know, I went, I went to, uh, to play in Russia, uh, and try to challenge myself a bit. You know, I, I'd, I'd only been in like a prep school setting and played, uh, youth hockey in, in the States, but now I was ready to, you know, challenge myself, like I said, and, uh, take, you know, take stuff, things to the next level. And, uh, I mean, the decision came to me really quickly. I didn't know if I really wanted to do it yet. And, you know, I, I just kind of said, you know, you got to man up and, you know, take the next, next step like your dad did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you went to overseas for a bit. You played about, I think, nine or eight games there. But before yeah. all the hockey came in, let's take it back to when you were uh, when you were growing up because you're very well traveled. You were born in Pittsburgh, I think, when your dad. No, I was, I was actually born in Greenwich, Greenwich, Connecticut, where I am okay. right now. Yeah. So you're born in the states, but then you came to Montreal. Then you went to Ottawa. Then yeah. you, you went back to the states. So, what was it like when you were little, like before hockey? If you didn't have to choose hockey, was would you were you thinking of maybe like more uh, soccer or what was your first choice before your dad before you chose hockey? You know, uh, hockey has always been my first choice. Like, you know, ever since I was kind of introduced to it, I, I, I kind of fell in love with it. I watched my dad get filmed in, you know, the, the Warrior commercial in, in that pond in Montreal. I, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm not familiar with all the names of Montreal, but I'm sure, you know, there's 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 a couple of ponds in the city. Uh, and uh, that specific time, I remember watching my dad shoot those pucks and, you know, have so much fun with it. And that kind of, you know, inspired me to get into it and have fun with it as well. So when you were in Montreal, um, what was the school you went to? Because uh, you must, did you go to a French school or English school, if you remember? Uh, in Montreal, I actually went to an English school. I went to Selwyn. Nice. Uh, so I actually knew uh, the, the Molsons, Will and uh, Henry. And, uh, you know, coincidentally, I actually, uh, Henry Molson ended up going to uh, Taft as well. So I got to reconnect with him. It was, it's kind of crazy, you know, old friends from Montreal get to meet again in the States. It's crazy. Was he your line mate in hockey or? Yeah, yeah. We actually played a, a good half of the season together. And, you know, we actually had a lot of good success. So that's pretty awesome. Weird. That's awesome. And and here's something else that's crazy. So I sent you a hockey card of your dad, uh, his his teammate, Robert Lang. So I want to give a shout out to my stepbrother here, uh, Joe, my stepbrother, Joey. He's a huge fan of like of Lang and Kovalev. So he wanted me to tell you that he remembers your dad when he was with Pittsburgh and he scored the game tying goal against Montreal. And he was just like, and my, he was banging on the glass because that's when Pittsburgh had that line of Straka, Lang and Kovalev. Yeah. And, do you remember, yeah. you ever watch highlights of the of that line? My my dad talks about it a lot. Uh, it, it was probably one of his favorite lines to play on. You know, they they always had something going. They always got creative when they were playing. So, uh, yeah, my dad has really great memories of playing with those guys. And I mean, myself, I haven't really had much time to kind of watch him play in uh, Pittsburgh. So, uh, I mean, I, I only hear stories. That's that's really all I get. And then you went to school with Robert's kids too. So were they also? Yeah. Did they also play hockey, or they were different athletes? They they did play hockey uh, for a bit, but uh, they kind of picked a, uh, to go to a different path. You know, they were they were more uh, surfers, and they they were uh, LA kids. So uh, you know, they they kind of grew up in that way too. From what I understand, too, like Robert is uh, he lives in San Diego. 
yeah. now, from what I understand. And um, I'm not sure which area because I have a family that lives in La Jolla. So like if if that was like when I went to when I went to San Diego, like one of my friends who was like a huge huge hockey fan, he's like, if you see Robert Lang, it's like I'm not stalking Robert Lang. It doesn't work like that. It's like leave. It's like I'm I'm here on vacation. I'm here to watch a Ducks game. I'm here to watch a Sharks game. So don't like just don't, man. Yeah, I mean I I never had the chance to visit the Langs in uh, up in Cali, uh, but you know they uh, they always invited us over. We just never had the chance, but. My my dad and Langers, you know, they stayed pretty good friends. Yeah, you, those those two of my favorite players were growing up to watch. And NHL 04, I mean NHL 06, my favorite thing would do is make a team, put put Kobe and uh, Rob on my on my team, and then I just like do the one timer glitch with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds great. Did you? Uh, so other than that, you know, as mentioned, I want to make the show about you. We'll get to more about some stories, but yeah. Um, what was it like when you uh, started realizing hockey? This is something that I could really like, really like do something with. Like, what what was like your aha moment? Uh, you know, I've actually always been told I'm kind of a late bloomer, um, and honestly, that kind of like aha moment didn't come to me until uh, I'd say I was like 15, something like that, where you know. I kind of saw um, one of my good friends get committed really early to go play in college. And I was kind of like, you know what, I, I kind of want to do that too. And, you know, that's not going to come easy to me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Kobe's kid, but at the same time, you know, I, I have to prove myself that, you know, I can be a good player too. And uh, when I saw a lot of my friends, like, you know, getting committed to play D1 and, you know, going to play USHL or some other junior leagues, you know, I was kind of like, you know, I need, I need to start stepping it up too. And uh, these past couple of years, I've, I've really been putting in the work and, you know, trying to play for uh, good teams and really challenge myself. It's pretty good. Now, what's this process like to getting committed? Because in Canada, there's the major junior circuit we have. But D1, yeah. USHL, what's, uh, what do you know the pro? How is it that they uh, select uh, guys? Uh, so, I mean, usually the the... Um, the hockey path most most uh, junior players take is they uh, play two years of juniors uh, and either apply after playing their first years of juniors, depending if, you know, uh, they know where they want to go to college or they take uh, both years uh, playing juniors and then see if they can get committed or get any offers playing somewhere else in college and you know, either, you know, go in after their first year or uh, play both both years and go in after. So that's so if is there like kind of scouting where they sign you to like sign of some sort of a contract or is there some sort of draft like we have in the CHL or is it just for, more like for colleges? You mean? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, no, like uh, for, for the call, the college system works a little differently where. Um, you know, a, a lot of colleges are, are scouting you and, and watching you play in, in juniors. And uh, at one point, you know, they they decide, you know, they, they see you're a good player and, you know, they, they want to take you in for, you know, for hockey. And uh, they are, they're also looking at your academics, you know, depending if you're going to, you know, an Ivy League school or maybe a, some other, you know, really good school. So academics also play a part uh, going in. But it's just basically you get selected to go to the, to the college school. Maybe you'll get a scholarship. Uh, but there's really no guarantee that you're going to be playing for the team because there are also walk-on kids who don't really get a commitment to play in college. But, um, you know, they, they just kind of show up to try out. And, you know, maybe they sometimes stun some coaches and end up getting that spot on the team. Pretty crazy. So when you say like they go to Ivy League schools, do you find there's a difference in the hockey programs between Ivy League schools and maybe non Ivy League schools? Like, do the, in the Ivy League schools you would say have better funding and better investment in their hockey program? Uh, you know, if you look at some schools, like you could definitely say that they have better funding. Like I, I once went to uh, for a tour in Notre Dame. And, like, if you look at their facilities and their rink, like, it, it almost looks like an AHL or even, like, NHL-type rink. So, uh, I mean, some schools definitely get better funding. I, I wouldn't say it's always the Ivy Leagues. Um, 
but yeah, some 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 schools, you know, they they really put a lot of investment into their hockey teams. There is that, yeah, like you say, Notre Dame, BC, BU, uh, yeah. and if it was BC or BU also like a team, some schools you were looking at as well, or? Uh, I mean, I, I definitely played a couple of showcases there. Uh, I mean, they weren't exactly like targets that I had uh, to to go to, but. You know, I, I just kind of wanted to see what my options would be in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I I wasn't really sure. What? Uh, what? So, when? So, once you uh, when you were in Taft, you know, you had like obviously, you know, you're a late bloomer. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter when you like when people peak because it's like it's like to each their own. You everybody's yeah. success path to success is different. What was it like playing for Taft when uh, you were when you were there? Uh, you know, I, I had a, I had a great time at Taft. Uh, you know, I got really close with a lot of the guys there because I mean, obviously we're living together and, uh, in the same dorms. So, uh, it was, it was great hanging out, uh, around them and maybe having them in some of my classes together as well. So, uh, I, I really enjoy that camaraderie and, um, you know, uh, obviously on the ice and in practices, you know, we all, we all have a good time. Uh, I mean, our, our coach obviously was uh, Ryan Shannon, who actually played in the NHL and won a cup with Anaheim. Uh, and, you know, he, he brought a lot of that NHL aspect to, to the team. Like we, we had like skill sessions and, you know, fun practices sometimes. But, you know, when brought bring in like seriousness and, you know, in, in intensity to the, to, to the team. So I, I had an amazing time there. I mean, like I said, it, the, the guys were great. Uh, the hockey was great. And, you know, I, I enjoyed myself. It's pretty nuts. That's pretty wild. Like, you know, it, it does help having those coaches like who've been in the show that know yeah. what it takes. So and do you and do you find it helped with your development as a player to help you find the kind of player you want to be? Because I'm sure, you know, with the name Kovalev, people are going to say, is he going to play like his dad? And, yeah. you know, you don't want to put that pressure on you because you mm-hmm. we've seen that story where kids of, of stars do that. And it just you know, it's it, it, it's a burden in a sense for them. So how do you feel like you've been able to balance becoming your own style of player without, you know, what's, how do I say it? Like without, you know, like living off your dad's name because you don't yeah. want to be like in a shadow. You want to be Nikita Kovalev, your own star. Right, right. Uh, well, I've kind of come to, to the point where, where I realize, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not going to play like him because, I mean, the, the world of hockey has just changed completely since when he played and, what it is now so I mean I obviously have to change my style up a bit and you know m- kind of my my skill set's a bit different than his you know I had I have a lot more speed than he did when he was my age so uh, you know in, in that sense my, my game's a bit different I mean obviously you, you can't say Kovalev without the hands and uh, I mean for me you know I'm, I'm trying to work on that but you know I'm, I'm nowhere near where he was so uh, that's that's one of the the aspects I, I kind of need to pick up, and I, I know I could do do better. Are you more of a playmaker, you would say, or like a shooter? Um, honestly, I've I've just kind of had different roles on on different teams. You know, uh, at Taft, I was a bit more of a playmaker. You know, and uh, like playing now in Danbury, I'm more of a goal scorer. So it's it honestly just depends on the team and and where I kind of uh, play in. That's awesome. And now you also went to Russia recently because, you know, there was a delay of the season for you guys in North America. So what was that like when, like, you had to describe that story, like, to where you had to say to yourself, I have to, I have to play, but I'm going to, I'm going to have to make a big decision. Well, I mean, there, there was really, like, uh, I actually start the, the story a bit at the beginning, uh, where in july there were kind of talks of me going to play in austria for that uh red bull academy in uh, salzburg uh and they had problems with covid and bringing players in so uh it was really tough to get um players from especially north america and overseas to to austria without you know breaking any covid regulations so that that ended up not happening and then one of the other offers in 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 august came up that you know I have an opportunity to play the MHL in, in, in Russia. Uh, and, and my dad kind of slapped this on my table uh, and told me I had kind of like two weeks to kind of decide. I mean, the the team had already started their uh, training camp and 
uh, they were all training together and going, you know, working out like three, two to three times a day, like on the ice for three hours. Um, so I was already a bit behind. Uh, so I, he, he kind of encouraged me to get there as soon as possible. So I wouldn't really mess up on the, uh, preseason training training. So, um, in a way I kind of rushed to make that decision. You know, I didn't really have the time to mentally prepare for what was coming. Uh, and you know, when, when I got there, I was, I was optimistic. I, you know, I was ready for this new experience. I knew it was going to be a lot more professional. It's, it's not really like the junior leagues here or where I'm playing right now. Um, kid, kids are really in it to win it. And, and the intensity is completely different than what I, what I've seen here. So, um, I, I really wasn't expecting what I, what I got. And, you know, it was, it was a really good three months for me to, kind of work at that intensity and see what, you know, junior professional hockey is, is all about. Was there a culture shock when you came from the U S to Russia? I mean, like, I understand you, you have Russian lineage, but when you got right. there, what was that like when you got off the plane at Mo at the, which airport did you get off at? Cause I know there's like the, the, the main ones are Moscow and then there's St. Petersburg probably. Yeah. No, I, was, I was in the Mo in Moscow. Yeah. Yeah. Sure was that what was that like when you got off there and it's like you're like okay well i'm in my dad's homeland now what was that like yeah uh i mean it was the first time being there in i'd say uh last time i was there probably like six years ago or something like that <laughs> like something crazy uh well I, I actually think it's even longer maybe like eight um so you know moscow really changed from the last time i was there you know it, it looked like a new city it was, it was all clean so many different restaurants and you know it, in a way it kind of became a little more americanized uh like when i went to the malls in, in in the city you could see a lot of the american brands you know like nike reebok like you know uh what we say like uh, Uni uniqlo which is japanese but uh you know you could see such such kind of like a different different culture than what I had seen eight years ago, where it was very Russian. It was, uh, the city felt kind of gray and, and, and gloomy, but, um, now it's all lit up. The streets are super clean. You have, you know, all, all these different stores and different restaurants to go to. So I was, I was so shocked. Like I was, I, I you know, I felt more comfortable than the first time I was there. That's that's awesome. So what was your favorite food to eat down there? Cause like, it's like, if I'm, if you're, if I go to Russia, uh, what is some? I've never tried Russian food. I always wanted to try Russian food. Oh, yeah. Some people say, "Oh, it's like Polish food, like with pierogi." It's not. And that's, what, <laughs> no. and that's what people have got to stop saying. So, if um, you could tell me what is a dish that I should try down there whenever I go, like authentic Russian food. You know what? I I always would recommend to get a hot bowl of borscht, the classic red soup. I I would say that's always a go-to for uh, newcomers to Russia. What about um, any like meat, like in terms of like how they cook the meat? Like, is there any style of meat too you recommend? Or uh, I mean, you can have some uh, shashlik, which is more of like a like a Georgian uh, version of like a kebab. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, kebabs are also Georgian, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's it's you know it's it's usually cooked over uh, coals. And you usually get this like char to the meat and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of what I lived on when I was over there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was my main source for protein. And, you know, uh, that's, that's the one thing I'm going to miss about being over there. <laughs> That's crazy. So you was you go to the MHL, which is the under the KHL. So still very good because you know some guys. I'm sure there's yeah. some pros that are from the KHL. They go into the MHL. Um, and I read the story that you wanted to get number 27, but yeah. <laughs> it was like there was like a whole story behind that. So um, what what happened exactly? Because in the end, you ended up picking like a pretty unique number for yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I came to the team like I said a, a bit late. Uh, so most of the players, you know, they had picked their numbers and most of the, most of the kids were veterans and usually all those kids, they pick all the, you know, famous Russian numbers, like, you know, 27, 17, 13, Dotsuk, you know, um, what else, the grade eight. So all those numbers were already taken. Uh, so 
uh, I, I really didn't know where to go because those are honestly all my favorite numbers, like uh, 27, 17, like 13. Uh, so I ended up having to settle with 90, which is just so out of the box. Like I, I, I was really so uncomfortable kind of wearing the number because I, I never wore anything close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and honestly, I had, I had a request to wear 97 because, you know, I, I love watching Connor McDavid right now, uh, dominating the NHL. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately they, they couldn't get me that number, but, uh, you know, I, I stuck with 90. It's still a pretty cool number because Thomas Tatar in Montreal wears it and he's yeah. like, so that's like, so there's nothing to be ashamed of there and that. <laughs> it's a very cool number. Like for me, I, and I love what you said about the numbers there because when I used to play deck hockey, you know, I'm not, I'm never going to be on the level of you. So don't worry, but I, I try, I'm trying to relate. Yeah, I want to try to relate. Like for me, the numbers that I wore were my numbers were a number four because, you know, obviously every defenseman okay. loves Bobby Orr. Yeah. I wore 26 at one point. I don't know. That was because like I met this smoke show and on like a cruise ship. And I was, <laughs> like, I'm going to wear Marty, 26. Marty St. Louis. Uh, yeah, maybe, or no, more like Paul Stastny or like oh, okay. Marty Rinsky. Um, then 55, because that's the birth year of my parents. And I think 55 okay. is like a veteran defenseman number. So Gonchar, I, I think Gon Gonchar was 55. Yes, Gonchar was 55. Um, yeah. Cronwall, Nicky Cronwall. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, and I was a stay-at-home defenseman in deck hockey. Like, you could ask my, yeah, my captain, John Ferry, and uh, teammate, Michael Lestoria. Like, like, I was never good. <laughs> I was, like, an enforcer. Well, well, that's another story we'll get into. But uh, <laughs> more, more on, on you, you know, you get 90. So, when you were playing, what was the level of play like there, going from, like, a prep school to now, like, bigger ice? Uh it was it was drastically different i mean honestly uh at, at taft our home rink was actually a larger sheet of ice I, I don't remember if it was um exactly up to the olympic size but but i believe we had something like that um so i was already used to that that space and having uh that that wide ice but the speed was so different and the game everything just happened so much faster and kids knew how to transition and uh they all had like a set regroup and a set breakout it's it, it was just so 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 differently and uh it was it, it was it, it really was like like a professional league you know play players were really playing like they were playing for money that's that's pretty crazy so when so there's a smaller ice as we see in the juniors and then the nhl but the bigger ice how do you feel that helps you you're with your decision making if you're making a play? Because I, I keep hearing this theory that like they say we should make the ice bigger in the NHL because it we could it could really showcase the skill. How can you say how can you explain why people are it's like that in Russia and why it's good in your own words for that? Uh well I guess you could say that, you know, players have more time with the puck. You you mm -hmm. can create more space for yourself, you know, by using, you know, uh, cuts and you know uh, circling back and uh, by doing those things you know you have more more time with the puck and you can look for a better play so uh, like when when you look at the KHL you see a lot of highlight plays uh, that involve a lot of good passing in uh, opposed to a lot of the uh, top plays in, in the NHL which is more based on personal skill I'm not going to say there aren't any like you know great passing goals because there obviously are but uh, more predominantly, you see them in, in the KHL. Uh, and that's because a lot of players, you know, they have more room with the puck, they have more space, and, it, you know, uh, it's easy, it's easier to leave guys open with, with all that space. So it's it's I would say it's kind of easier to find guys as well and, and kind of uh, get into the house. That's really interesting because, so because, you know, you're more of a playmaker, you said, since you went over there. So what was, what did, what did you enjoy about the bigger ice in terms of your decision and helping you and helping you see the ice better? What did you like about the bigger ice? Uh, you know, it, like I said, you know, it, it gave me more time with the puck and <clears throat> let me try to, you know, create some, something of my own. Uh, uh, which is actually something, you know, my dad always emphasized is try to create space for yourself and, and, and try to find the open guy. But, you know, also don't be afraid to kind of show showcase your talent 
because there are obviously always going to be opportunities for you to kind of break through or break, break between two guys. So uh, it kind of gave me an opportunity to try those things against higher skilled players. But at the same time, I playing at this, you know, higher pace in this higher pace league, I had to make plays faster as well. So uh, kind of my decision making had to, you know, speed up and I had to, you know, keep up with all the guys in that way. That's that's great. That's awesome. And now the training methods, much different from North America. And a lot of people are like in awe of the Russian training methods, whether you do martial arts, whether you play hockey, whether you do soccer. What is it that makes Russia like such like like everyone's like in awe of the training? What is it that you saw that made that you can that you that made you think like, wow, this is there's levels to this. Well, I mean, it, it's it, it's like I said, like they they treat those kids like professionals, and that that goes from you know getting to the game like two and a half hours before and having a professional approach to uh, pre games to also off ice training and you know preseason regiments, uh, like it's it's just it's so different uh, in in the way they approach their um, preseason. You know, you like like I said last time. You know, the kids were working out twice a day, skating on the ice three times. You know, running I don't know like 20, 20 kilometers with uh, twenty pound weighted vests. So, you know, they it, it's really no joke. Like you're you're all hockey when you're when you're over there. So, they like they live they live and breathe it. It's like it's not like yeah. in Quebec or it's not like in Montreal or say like in. The US where it's like, okay, we'll go, we'll get, we'll go on. We have like some trade, we're going to do some off ice training of like maybe weight yeah. training, some mobility work. There it's like, it's like, okay, it's like you're running with a weight vest. You're going to run up a hill. You're going to do hill runs. You're going to do, you're going to, what's the thing, what's the drill they do? They, they make you wear like a parachute now or like on the ice to try to like for skating. Do you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, the parachute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the parachute, and they also usually like to tie tires to your to your back using a rope, what? or they like you have to put your stick in the tire and you you know take it all the way down the ice. Yeah, they they love doing that that crazy stuff with weights. It's they're they're all like high intensity, uh, big weight. You know, it's it's they're they're crazy, <laughs> but it may be that much better. It may be that much better and that much more committed. Everyone says that. Like, I mean, I do martial arts now, as you know, when we first, when you and I first interacted over DM. So I do, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Kyokushin style karate. It's huge in Russia. No, uh, honestly, no. I, I, I wasn't uh, that big into martial arts when I was over in Russia. It was mm -hmm. kind of when I was more over here. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually went to one of, I, I think it was uh, GSP's last fight. In uh, I, I, he he fought in Mad Madison Square Garden. I I don't remember yeah. if it was his last one, but I was I was that was my first UFC event, and I loved it. What was it like being at Madison Square Garden? Oh, it was it was electric. You know, you know, all the fans were going crazy. I I, I don't remember who was fighting in some of the prelims, but uh, in one of the fights, it was one of the craziest knockouts I've ever seen. I think it was like some spinning elbow to the to the head, and I was like. My friends and I were in awe. It was, it was nuts. I, I think I know which card. There. Yeah, so that was his last fight versus Bisping. And yeah. on that other card, it was Joanna versus Thug Rose. Right. Um, Cody versus TJ. And then Steven Wonderboy Thompson versus Jorge Masvidal. Before Masvidal became like the star he is today in MMA. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So I, I that was probably a, a great UFC event to be, to be at. Uh, definitely. Always, the, it's always the Madison Square Garden cards. I mean, whether it's the con, the first UFC one, which was the year before, the the Connor card was wild because that was the yeah. first time they got into New York finally, and the year after GSP, and then the year after was kind of a, eh, it was kind of because DC fought on there, and I'm not a DC fan, you know. I respect DC, but I'm a John Jones fan. That's why. Oh, okay. but, yeah, yeah, respectable. Yeah. But but the the year after. <laughs> The Nate Diaz Masvidal, that was a wild card. That yeah. was a yeah. I yeah. I actually unfortunately missed that card. Oh, it was such a good one. Uh, yeah, good I, one. I I I did miss that. I I wouldn't admit, but I I heard very good things about that fight. It really was good. And when you were in Montreal, so you also done martial arts. So what yeah, was yeah. so what's your background exactly, and what and uh, what you did? Uh 
so my my dad actually was into uh, Taekwondo at one point because it helped him with like, you know, his flexibility, his flex- hip flexibility and, you know, it helped him recover. So when I was younger, when I was uh, in, 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 in Greenwich here, uh, I don't remember how young I was. I was probably uh, like seven, something like that. And my dad took me to this one dojo for Taekwondo in, in uh, Harrison, New York. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of put me in, in there and was like, you know, you should, you should try this, you know, it it helped you with hockey and help you, you know, recover and and be more flexible. And because, because it's a very important part for hockey. Uh, and you know, that, that's when I kind of started with martial arts and, uh, I didn't, I don't think I got any higher than a yellow belt. So, uh, my experience is pretty limited there. But uh, uh, recently I got back into martial arts because I've been doing a lot of uh, kickboxing as part of my uh, part of my training. I actually went two days ago for the first time in two years. Um, So uh, I'm getting back into it as well. Uh, Yeah, that's I, you know, I I, I love martial arts. I, I love watching them. And I also think it's pretty cool to to know it yourself. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I love about that's what it is because I used to love hockey, but eventually what happened was um, when I played deck hockey, like we kept winning championships. So I was, I was never a skilled player, and I'm all, and I'm gonna make that very clear. But I knew how to find make teams, and I knew how to coach. So that's something okay. I will always take away. And the last time we won a cup, um, like I put together the greatest. It's like, you know, I'm going to give shout out to all my, to some of my teammates here. Like, so, uh, Dan Greco, Michael Lastoria, and Michael Story also is like a big fan of like you and your dad. When I told him, I was like, oh, right. uh, Nick's coming on my show. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> I have to <laughs> so give you, Mike a shout out. You, you, you coached uh, yeah. a team? Yeah. I coached. Uh, so here's what happened. So I didn't want to coach, but, uh, it's not, a, it's kind of a sad story, but don't worry. You know, I'm going to try to stay in a positive right. way. So, all right. uh, 2014, um, my dad passed away, so I, and my Sorry. mindset. Thank you, but it's okay though. You know right. what? Like, yeah, uh, it's like it's you know what though. Like, it made me a better person. That's what it did. You know, I'm not, right. uh, but because that's what it is. But I will say this: always, if be if your parents, I'm just gonna say this to you from like as a friend here. Always be there for your parents. Like, if they always say, if they ever yeah. tell you Nick or your brother, I've your brother, what's your brother's name? Ivan again. Uh, Ivan. But I mean, Yvonne? the spelling's Ivan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ivan or Ivan. If they say Nick, Ivan something doesn't feel right with us in our body, send them to the hospital to get checked out. You never, ever know. So my dad like passed away from cancer anyways. So 2014, um, I wasn't struggling mentally, you know, like I, I, I wanted to play, but then I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to coach. I said, I think I'm just going to coach. I said, this is the best decision I can make. So I became a coach in deck hockey. Thanks to, uh, uh, my friend John's uh, request, and he's like, yeah, he's like, I think you have what it takes. Like, you're a good communicator. You're a people person. So I did that and um, made it to the finals, but we lost. But then the last season, oh. I, yeah, the last season, it was the last dance. Like that guy, I said to them, like I told all the guys I played with that are star players, this is it. The so guys, this is it. I'm uh, like, I think this is we calling it a career. So just loaded it up and uh, I was in San Diego when we won the, the cup, but uh, yeah. And it was a, uh, that was the best season I ever coached. I loved awesome. it. I mean, it's, it, that's a great way and to a coaching career, you know, when you win something. Uh, it was, it, I could, I wouldn't have won it any other way. Yeah. I loved it. It really, it makes you see the game in a different way because when you're playing, it's one thing, but when you're coaching, you have to understand every player's different. Like you can't be like cheating. Yeah. It's like, if I'm coaching you, Let's say I'm coaching you and one of your teammates, okay? I can't treat your teammate the same way I treat you. Like, I can't be mm-hmm. like, like, I can't be like, you know what? I, I'm not going to say, like, you know what? That was a shit play. You guys didn't do good here. Yeah. My role as a coach is to see, like, okay, what is he struggling with here? What can I do to put him in here? So I'll be like, okay, you want to play on the power play or up, like, three to one? Is that going to get you your confidence up? Put him on the power play and get to yeah. go and... I mean, it's it's good that you pay attention to that because, you know, I, I see a lot of coaches who, you know, don't do that. I mean, I was lucky enough to not ever have to play under one, but uh, there, there are a lot of coaches that, you know, they they just try to build a team and, and sometimes it's just a moneymaker and 
they don't care so much for the actual team and just want to pick all the best players. Um, but, you know, I, I really appreciate the coaches that try to take the personal approach, try to get to know their players. And, uh, you know, I, I often think that that's the, always the most successful coach when, when you actually get close with your players and try to get to know them uh, because you get to know them on a personal level. And sometimes you get to know and find out, you know, things aren't going great in their lives. And sometimes that makes them feel better. And, and that, like you said, it helps them build their confidence. And, you know, sometimes putting them on the power play, you know, is, is a build of confidence or putting them on the first line. So uh, you never know with some players and, and you can always find some kind of hidden talent within some of those quiet players. Very true. I mean, like I like the way I, the, my philosophy as a coach I mean, when I compare my coaching style, like for hot for I like to take the Phil Jackson approach, as you saw. Did you watch okay. the last dance? Yeah, yeah, I, I I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Phil Jackson it? is such a great coach. <laughs> I still think we can say the real champ of the last dance is Dennis Rodman. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he he really got a lot of credit for uh, for his things. I, I I absolutely loved his mentality where. You know, all he focused was on getting rebounds. And, you know, when, when you have such a huge focus on one thing and one thing only, you know, you could be the king of that thing and that can make you a good player. So it's, I, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So I would, yeah. So I was definitely saying my style was Phil Jackson, getting to know the players personally. But when it comes to hockey, I would say my, my coaching style. For ball hockey, for deck hockey, well, yeah, deck hockey it's called. I definitely say my coaching style in the NHL would have to be not Quinville, but I would have to say um, more torts. or less. No, no, no. I'm not. A, I, I would never. I was. I'm not like torts. I'm not like torts. It would have to be. Uh, that's a tough one. De you know what? I'd say Bob Hartley. Bob. Okay, Hartley. that's respectable. Yeah. yeah knew how to manage the stars you know he knew how to keep it calm and uh that my and like i just loved it it, it just it changed it, I, I loved it like i mean i love and you know what to be honest i like coaching more than playing in the end okay um you know i i, I would have to kind of ask ask my dad that question because you know him being a player uh and and now coaching you know it, it i i i'm kind of curious to know whether what he think what his thoughts are on you know being a head coach for the first season. What? Yeah, he's a coach now. I thought he's growing the game in uh, Kunlun for uh, the KHL. Well, yeah, he's he's the coach, uh, the head coach of the Kunlun team. No like, way. Like, yeah. What was that? What's that like? You know, he that must be tough because like they, I know the KHL wants to really grow their influence yeah. in uh, the world. They're doing a good job, I think. Um, so what's, uh, what's your, what's your dad's role other than being a coach? Does he have like other responsibilities that come with the, that title? I mean, I would say like, you know, some player management to, to an extent, you know, uh, and with the new COVID, you know, problem, you know, he always has to be on, on guard to see if, you know, players got COVID recently, you know, who's at in and out of the lineup during times and, um, you know, it was it was kind of a complicated time for him and his team. You know, they they didn't get some some of their main players until later in the season, uh, because of the restrictions of uh, bringing in international players uh, into Russia. So um, it was a, it was a slow start. It was a real stressful time, but in the end, they kind of you know, put, finally put the team together, had had a had a good run, and you know, unfortunately, that that uh, weak start kind of you know blew out their season but now they're like so they're out of the they're so Cunlin is kind of in the playoffs or they're kind of no like... I mean, yeah, unfortunately like you know this season oh. they were they're out yeah but um, I mean that that's all right I mean she it, it was kind of like a tough season like I said with with the whole COVID situation but you know I I believe that they can do you know a lot better I mean I've, I've seen them play a couple of times and they're they're a solid team and I, I wouldn't underestimate them one of my favorite stories in the KHL is the Vityaz team. Have you ever heard stories about that Vityaz team where the owner just book, like would sign enforcers to like come play? Do you ever watch the Spin and Chicklets episode with Ian Hennessy? No, no, I haven't actually. <laughs> it's the it's the greatest ep. Okay, the Ian Moran episode is amazing. As I yeah, <laughs> I just recently yeah listened to that one. Okay, 
the Hennessy one, this is a guy named Hennessy. He's a defenseman. And the only reason why they signed him was because of his last name, Hennessy. So they brought him <laughs> to Russia. And the Vityas, Vityas Chekhov, so that's Panarin's old Russian team. Yeah. And apparently the KHL got like the old, like the, 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 do we have a do they have a commissioner over there? Like what? How did how does it run? Because yeah, we I know there's a commissioner in the NHL. What is it in the KHL? Is it president? Oh, I've, I honestly I have no idea. I I think they have like a president. I know they have a president of like the Russian Hockey Federation, but uh, I, I honestly I don't know. I'm not too familiar with the structure in the KHL. Don't worry. I don't. I'm not gonna. Oh, yeah. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to confuse you. So, um. So here's the story. So Hennessy goes to to Ch- Vityaz, and the owner was like, say, like saying, he's like, you know why I brought you here? And he's like wearing, like a like a hoodie, like that says like Thug Life, and he's got the he's got like he's got enforcers like Chris Simon, um, so other enforcers, but Chris Simon was one of them. Right. So, so he used to always get enforcers, and he said, and apparently the president of the KHL said, listen, he's like, if you don't start getting skilled players into your team. We're gonna have to take the team away from you because it's like it's ruining hockey. That's crazy. I I've never heard of that story. It's, That's it's, I'll, I'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah, look it up. It's a uh, Hennessy. I think his name is Josh Hennessy. That's the one. So and he talks about how he saw Panarin and talk about Panarin, man. Like I'm that's someone that you've also been like yeah. liking lately. Like how crazy is it? Never got drafted. Undersized. Kid's yeah. like the greatest like player of this decade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've actually got to meet him in person. Uh, so, you know, lo- looking at him, you know, he's he's actually almost like smaller than me. Like, uh, he's I think like one seventy, one hundred seventy pounds, and like I don't know, like five five eleven or something like that. I, I I don't exactly know his height, but you know, he's he's a surprisingly small guy, but he's powerful. You know that, and that's what kind of separates him. Like when you look at a guy like Martin Saint Louis, like that, he he's kind of comparable to that. He's just a small guy who knows how to power his way through. Him playing with Patrick Kane, I think, really helped ex- like showcase how good yeah this kid is. He also yeah. played in yeah. So there's that. And what do you think of him like in New York? Do you find there's similarities between your father and, and uh, Artemi in a sense, or? Who they work more Saint? I know you said Saint Louis, but I I find there is a bit of a similarity. It's the stick handling. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, when my dad, I'd say when he played in New York, he, I mean, he obviously had the skill, uh, and uh, he 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 was also definitely on the lighter side. So I mean, yeah, you know what, you you could probably connect those two. Uh, but but I I wouldn't say they were similar in 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 their play style for sure. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, I, th- I think it was a bit different. Uh, and especially with the hockey at the time, it was, you know, 1992 when, when he first played for them. So it's completely different area for hockey. Yeah. I, I can't, I couldn't believe I found all my Kovalev cards. I was like, Oh my God, I got to <laughs> send these to Nick. Like there's the McDonald's one, the upper deck one. There's like, I had a, yeah, there's like, I have a big binder for not just of other players in general. Cause I used to know every hockey stat like you could you could name me off like one like you could name me off randomly when did this player get drafted i'd be like uh this year when did he get picked <laughs> uh, uh, he got picked at this round and he scored this and this so yeah like um so what was the most memorable so you know living in montreal uh what were the most memorable <coughs> highlights that you had watching your dad play oh uh you know to be honest i i kind of wish i paid attention more <laughs> Uh, I mean, as much as I loved hockey, I, I didn't always watch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I, I enjoyed watching it when I did, but I, I wasn't super, you know, into it when my dad was kind of at the peak of his game, which is kind of a shame because I, I kind of missed out on a lot and, uh, I, I could have picked up on a, on a lot of things. And, uh, I mean, I'm obviously watching hockey, like really attentively now. Like I, I, I always have an eye on you know, a specific player during a game and, you know, watching his movements and, and, and everything uh, and not just his highlights. But, you know, I, I wish I had the chance with, with uh, like that with my dad where, you know, I could kind of see him in action and and really get a feel for what t- type of player he, he he was, not just through his highlights. You know, I have to be honest. There's one thing I want to share when we were telling this, but I had to say it to you, you know, like um, I remember that 5 nothing game where they were trailing 5 oh, nothing. Yeah. 
my dad was watching with me that game, and he's like, listen, he's like, if, if New York scores another f- damn goal to make it 6 nothing, we're leaving. Michael Ryder scores. Michael Ryder scores again. Mark Streit scores. Then uh, I think uh, one of the Kostitsin brothers scores. Mm-hmm. And uh, then five minutes left out of nowhere, they put Saku with your dad. Your dad f- scores the goal falling down, and he yeah. became an I- he became an icon. That that game, February two thousand eight, he became an icon of Montreal. Yeah. He solidified his god his he solidified his <laughs> legend status with that with that tying goal, and uh, that was a crazy season. That's yeah. my favorite season of Montreal. And I, I feel like at, at at that point, that's really when I got kind of like my first idea of how good my dad really was you know i i never really looked at him like as being like someone who's you know so so good in the nhl like i I didn't really get an understanding of how how great he was until i kind of started seeing all this stuff and and people talk about him and and like you know it's 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 kind of incredible now really looking back at it like how lucky. <laughs> was it hard to leave Montreal, like, in 2009, if you remember? Because, I mean, I know your dad wanted to stay. He was willing to take a hometown discount. Like, he really wanted to end his career in Montreal. And I'm going to be honest, like, a lot of Habs fans, including myself, like, I, I stopped watching hockey for a bit after because I was really pissed with the the way the management chose not to bring him back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of a shame that he never had, like, kind of like a legacy with any teams like he, he you know he was always moving around and uh when, when I kind of look at him in Montreal you know I, I would say that that would have been like the, the team for him well I mean kind of tied with him in Pittsburgh playing with playing in Straka you know that that was always a great combo and my dad always talks about how he loved playing with those guys and playing for that team but uh when I mean when I think of my dad I, I think of him playing for Montreal for sure it was uh, and so you went to sell one house, and then yep. when you left, so then you went back to the U.S. After you went to a school in Ottawa. What was... I, I went to school in Ottawa. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I obviously spent the spring and summer uh, back at home here in the U.S. Uh, but then I went over to uh, Ottawa and then went to a French American school there. What was that like? Was it like uh, different? Uh, it was definitely different. I mean, definitely the structure to all the classes was, you know. It was more through the French system. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, grades had, like, I don't know if you're familiar with this. I'm sure you are. Like, let's say CE2 or, like, CM1. And, you know, it's it's just, it, it was crazy different. And uh, it's just a completely different structure and the way the classes are structured, having English, English uh, French, like, even having, like, a separate geography class. Uh, yeah. So, um it was it, it's completely different than uh you know what i think school is 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 now like you know there's there's a completely different system like if you think of like the public school system with having blocks block schedules and you know um being uh and then later in in your high school career how you can change your classes and kind of customize your whole schedule like it's uh, this this whole french system was completely different threw you into a loop so you got so you got so that threw you into a loop um what was i yeah oh here's here's what i want to ask you so once so once your dad retired from hockey you know now you're in the u.s um do you prefer if you could go if you could would you want to live in canada or still in the u.s what do you prefer uh you know i i always want to spend more time in canada than i did uh, because I made a, a lot of really good friends there. Uh, I have a lot of good childhood memories being there, you know, going sledding, playing pond hockey. Um, you know, I because I, I love being in Canada. I, I, you know, absolutely love that place. Uh, but I've, I've definitely grown comfortable here in the U.S. and, and made, obviously, my own group of friends. But uh it's it's really a tough one but um i i definitely love to go back to canada for sure yeah you come to montreal you message me and i'll make sure when restaurants are open i'll take you to some good places so just <laughs> message me when you're here buddy i'll make sure you're taken care of don't worry like you're in All good right. hands Sounds, that works for you I, I'd, I'd i'd love to come back you know i i definitely would so and um now the u.s world juniors they've been killing it the world juniors you know the under 20s how is it that the u.s has become such a powerhouse nikita what do you think that's been a, a 
And I, how do you think that's led to that? Because they always beat us, and I'm getting fed up of this. Like, I'm... <laughs> um, you know, I wasn't feeling good about the U.S. team at the start of the tournament. Uh, you know, I I thought you know th- they kind of started slow. You know, they weren't moving the the way I thought they they would be. Um, and you know, I, I was thinking like, you know what, this is going to be like, you know, Russia's like freeway to the, to the final and they're going to play Canada. Uh, but then as the tournament went on, they just kept looking better and better with each game. And by the time they got to the playoffs, like they just had it all figured out. Like, uh, I, I was watching, I don't remember they, they were playing, uh, Finland, I believe. And, uh, like I was just watching like they're like Finland's like a tough team to play against and they were moving the puck so well, like f- finding ways to get inside the house, like getting shots from everywhere. Uh, and, and their passing was tremendous. You know, there was every, every pass was on tape and guys were opening up moving and, you know, it was, it was great to see them play so well. I mean, I, to be honest, I was cheering for Russia and I kept telling my friends that Russia would beat the U S like, uh, especially watching them start the tournament that way. Uh, but you know, they, they said Russia kind of disappointed. <laughs> I don't know what happened with that Askarov kid. Cause I, cause one of my friends who's a big pros, my friend, Steven is like a big prospect uh, nut. Mm-hmm. He's like, Askarov is the best goalie of that draft. He's like, Askarov is like going to be like, he's like as good as Carey Price. But yeah. I was like, what was he doing? Throwing his stick around. I'm like, that's not, well, not typical. I, I, I thought it was pretty funny. I mean, um, you know, I definitely respect him as a goalie. Like he's he's tremendous. He was he stood on his head for uh, a lot of the games for Russia, but you know, obviously he kind of had an unfortunate uh, game. Uh, I I obviously don't know what was going on with the stick, but uh, it was it was kind of fun to see. Like I, I love social media's reaction to all of this, like all the all the memes and all the jokes going on around the uh, Askarov stick, uh, and I actually saw that he got a good laugh out of it as well. Um, so, you know, uh, again, like I said, he's, he's still a great goalie. You know, I, I wouldn't under, un, under appreciate him. I think he's going to be a star, but you know what I liked about this Russian team? I feel that this generation of Russians, they understand you need to be speak English. A lot of them were giving English yeah. interviews and that's something that we never really saw because in my, you know, now I'm, I'm getting old. I'm 29, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I'm, I'm old. So back in <laughs> no, my no, day. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, say, I'd say pre pre thirty still young, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, what's interesting about Russia is when they were coming over, there was always the language barrier. A lot of them never yeah. really accustomed to the Western lifestyle. A lot of stars that were like first round picks, you know, they go back to Russia because they just could not adapt. Some adapted, but like they would never. But it's like they forced. They had to force themselves. Like guys like Fedorov. I mean. Uh, well, your father, I think your dad was re- just, your dad was just meant for like Western life in a sense. So. <laughs> uh, I mean, he definitely had his struggles, but uh, yeah, he, he, he knew what it, what it took and, and he did it. He did a good job trying to get adjusted. He, he really did. Like there was him, Zubov, Sergei Zubov, like yeah. all those guys, like, um, but uh, this Russian team now, like they're really showing like, you know what? We want to be more like, it, like what's the word media friendly or, you know, more right. like accessible. And do you think that's going to just help people maybe gravitate towards liking this new generation of Russian stars? Uh, you know, I, I, I sure hope so because uh, being up there, I, I saw all the talent that was, that was up in Russia and all the, up, you know, young upcomers, like there's, you know, one, one kid uh, that plays for uh, one of the Scott teams uh, and he's he's like 15 years old, and he's you know one of the leading goal scorers for uh, in in the entire league. So uh, you know there's there's definitely an uprising with a lot of good Russian players come coming up. So I you know I, I really hope uh, people you know accept them, uh, and especially with their efforts you know trying to like you said trying to learn to speak English. And you know you're right. I I would say that it would help them. You know, try to get attention from people. I really think because it's like, I mean, you know, you look, you're very lucky. You know, you were born in the U.S., so you have both the luxury yeah. of like, having. So you see both sides. I've taken Russian history. So when I used to ask, when I took Russian history, I asked my professor, I said, why is it 
that whenever like Russians come over, when they're whenever they're like um, like stars or politicians, they always have a translator with them. She's like, well, how? She's like, how? She's like, why don't you go on their side and 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 understand what it's like to probably have an enemy at the gate always, whether it was Nazi Germany or then the Cold War, and you have to see it from their side because they feel that one side is always trying to push their influence down their throat, and it's like it's what it's called the Habesian theory, which means like there's someone always at our gate ready to attack. So that's why. I think um, there is kind of that reluctancy from a lot of Russians. I may be wrong, but you, do you know what I mean? If in a sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, I kind of get that. I mean, uh, a lot of more, a lot more players in Russia are kind of more comfortable just trying to go play in the KHL and not even travel abroad. But you know, I, I would say a, a lot, a lot of that is changing now, and and I kind of got a sense of that being around some of those Russian players. Like a lot of them were talking about. You know, coming over to here to play play juniors, like go play in the OHL, go play in the AHL, hopefully, uh, and you know maybe that will help them pave pave their path towards the NHL. So you could definitely see kind of like a, a change in mentality over in Russia, where a lot of players kind of are starting to, you know, con- consider going to play in the NHL over the KHL. That's really good. Like you guys, guys like Kirill K- Kaprizov, who's just lighting it up. Like. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know he's. Uh, like I, I think uh, where where does he play again? I'm I'm honestly really bad with my players and, and teams. Like uh, Kirill play. plays for Minnesota. Oh, Minnesota. That's right. Uh, I, I was thinking of uh, Giryanov. Um, he's he's one of the new upcomers for Dallas. Um, I, I think he was up over playing in the KHL for a bit, and then mm-hmm. they brought him over, and he's he's been absolutely learning it up now. Uh, so. Yeah, a lot of those young Russian stars are coming over and you know showing what they got. <laughs> does it make you? Does it make you proud? Like you know, being like a dual citizen of both Russia and the U.S. Does it make you proud to see what's happening? Like when with what's going on for uh, Russian hockey? Yeah, uh, because you know I, I I I love Russian hockey. Like I've you know usually when I watch uh, you know the World Juniors or you know the Olympics, I I usually cheer for. For, for Russia with you know with the US being a close second I mean I'm, I'm not trying to pick favorites but uh, <laughs> like that's that's just kind of like the the way our whole household is that you know we're always cheering for the Russians your your dad uh, won Olympic gold medal one of the unified team in 92 in yeah. Albertville have you ever seen the photo or the gold medal like that he has like uh... oh yeah I've seen I've seen the medal for sure yeah it's 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 definitely really cool but uh, I don't want to. I don't want to touch any of those things because you know I, I feel like it's kind of bad luck. You know, if you really want to do it yourself, you you wouldn't really uh, get close to any of those things because I I feel like it's just bad luck. Like I I've heard people say like if you touch the Stanley Cup uh, before you win it, like you you might not win it. So. Yeah, exactly. There's there's also there you're so there's that there's all those accomplishments. Um, when it comes to and then when it comes to what what's the next step for you you feel because now you're playing for the Springfield or Danbury hat tricks as you know because there's like kind of that name controversy yeah <laughs> what's the, yep. the expectation for 2021 uh you know it's it's kind of complicated um because I you know I, I enrolled at Union and then deferred uh to, 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 you know, play juniors, obviously. Uh, and next year, I'm still trying to decide whether I, I want to go in or uh, play another year of juniors, maybe try the M- MHL again or mm-hmm. uh, play somewhere here, whether it be in the USHO or the North American Hockey League. So, um, you know, I, I honestly, there's a lot of uncertainty still, but... Um, trying to see if I'll, I'll open kind of any options playing for for Danbury right now. So you were a draft eligible. So how many more years of eligibility do you have for the draft? Are you this year, just your draft eligible year? or? I mean, last year was. I mean, next year will be as well. Mm-hmm. You'll make it. Something tells me. I have a feeling you're going to make it. I mean, I, ha- I have time. You know, there's, like I said, I'm I'm, I'm a late bloomer, so. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I still have a lot to learn and, you know, I, I don't, you know, plan on stopping anytime soon. So, you know, I'm, 
planning on going somewhere. You just got to enjoy the ride, man. You know, you got to, you yeah. can't, you can't force it. Like for me, um, and I can equate this to martial arts. Like everyone wants to be a black belt right away. They all want to be the black belt, but then when they get there, it's not enjoyable. They stop. So you just got to enjoy the journey. You've got to really trust the process as this, as cliche as I, it sounds. I definitely agree. I mean, I, I definitely want to get most out of the journey, meet a lot of new guys, play for a lot of different teams and di different places. Um, you know, kind of get a little bit of, of everything and, and learn from every single experience. So, you know, uh, playing in all these different leagues will kind of build uh, specific skill sets because I'll be under, um, you know, different roles every on, on every team and playing different positions. So, you know, having having this toolbox of, of skills that I acquired from playing for every single team, you know, that's that's what will take me to the next level. And, uh, you know hopefully that that will put everything together it's really good man I'm, I'm really happy to see that like i like i really see big things for you and even if you don't even if you make it to the to the show or not what matters is you played some level of pro and i always like to tell people this you know when you reach that level you're doing what only one percent can do and nobody can take that away from you and if anyone who says well this doesn't fit, you know what <laughs> block it out nikita block it out they don't they don't know you they don't know your struggle they don't know your story only you know that and those who respect you and support you like myself because right. you know you took the chance to come on my show and you know <laughs> so anytime anytime someone uh, takes the chance to like come on i'm gonna support them all the way loyalty is a big thing for me i always i always want to see those that i meet and interact with succeed in some capacity yeah thank you i, I appreciate that and you know, I'm, I'm. I know a lot of people, you know, are are saying and and rooting for me to, to, you know, make it all the way. And you know, I'm I'm giving it my best. You know, I'm, I'm I'm really I'm really shooting to get, to get up there. And you know, hope hopefully I do. And that that's gonna be my goal, going all the way. I'm not I'm not stopping short. You you just gotta keep do pushing, man. No matter what. And who knows? Like at the end of the day, like I'm gonna tell you some stories. So I wanted to be a history. I wanted to be a lawyer. I want to be a history teacher. You know what I'm doing with my degree? I'm doing a podcast with it to talk about <laughs> history or like martial arts history. So you know what? Success isn't linear. So whenever, whatever, yeah. however this journey takes you, you've got to just look at what's going to happen. Because who knows? Maybe one day, you look at it, like maybe one day someone might tap you like as an NHL, like pro scout. They might say, hey, Nick, you know what? Why don't you go manage this team in uh, Finland or Sweden? You know, we understand that you've played in all these leagues. You understand play the development in these leagues so this is where we want to hire you as a manager do you also yeah. think about that too like as uh, other options i mean i i definitely want to keep myself in the hockey world mm -hmm. so you know whether it be like coaching or, or or managing a team you know i you know i I'd definitely be interested but I, I, would, I would kind of put that until you know I'm, I'm done playing which you know still a long ways away <laughs> nice so here's a good question I have for you. So now we're going to change it up to pop culture with like films, okay. TV. So Mighty Ducks, uh, original Mighty Ducks movie or the new one that Disney Plus is making? Oh, uh, you know, I'm excited to see what they're going to bring in the new one. But, you know, the ori you, you really can't beat the originals. You know, no. it's it's just such a classic. No, but uh, I, I I wouldn't say it's my favorite hockey movie. Okay, what's your what's your hockey movie? Uh, I I would say my favorite hockey movie is Mystery Alaska. I've never I, I've heard of it, but I never seen it. It's so funny and so great. I you know it's it's just a perfect representation of you know of just what hockey players are are, are like. It's it's so funny. There's that. Okay. Um, any TV? What's your What's the TV show you've been watching lately? Like that you've been binging since you're at home now? Uh, you know what? I've been through a lot of shows uh, recently. Uh, I mean, obviously, I I I, I uh, watched Last Dance, uh, Coach's Playbook. Um, uh, in terms of entertainment, I guess I I watched Community with uh, Donald Glover. Uh, who's who I really appreciate for all he's done and achieved. Uh, and then I also watched uh, just recently Cobra Kai, which you know, I kind of oh, like. Yeah. yeah, I, I you like binge, Cobra Kai. Did you binge all three seasons? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely did. <laughs> who's your favorite character? 
or characters? Ooh. You know what? That's a tough one. Uh, you're gonna have you're gonna have to help me out on these names. <laughs> Because I'm I'm really bad with names. I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you um the main characters. There's Johnny. There's Daniel. Yep. Obviously, yep. Hawk, Miguel, okay. uh, Robbie, Dan, Johnny's son. That's kind of like trouble. Okay. But, yeah. Uh, then you know I I definitely like Johnny. Um, you know it's it's just such an interesting like kind of problem that he has. No way, like he's just trying to be good, but he doesn't really know in which direction to go. Um, and you know, I, I obviously love Daniel as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's it, yeah, it just gives me such like nostalgia because I remember when I first watched uh, Karate Kid and I absolutely loved it. So you know, seeing a lot of those flashbacks go back to that movie, it's it's. I, I it, it really brings such nostalgia. I, I love it. They did the reboot right. They, that's a one way you have to do a reboot. Because when you think of a yeah. reboot, they always mess it up. <laughs> always mess it up. And they got it right. And then, so when season three yeah. came out, I closed my door. I tell my nieces that come over. I'm like, don't bug me. My door's closed. It's my day today. I just finished <laughs> all 10 episodes within a day. Yeah. I, I, I watched, I think, like... When I first started watching it, I watched it like on the bus rides over to games and stuff. And, you know, I'd be sitting there on the bus watching it for like three, four hours straight. And it's just just cranking one after another. 20 minute episodes. And <laughs> yeah. So and when it comes to Uber and when it comes to Uber Eats or no, because now we have to stay at home. What's your go to uh, junk food? Honestly, I, I I don't really eat McDonald's or you know Burger King or any of those really fast food places. You know, I I love chopped, uh, chopped creative salads, uh, which uh, it's not a huge chain, mm -hmm. but uh, you know you know it's it's the healthier option, and they have all kinds of you know bowls. They have like cold salads, warm bowls where they have all kinds of like protein and and different veggies and stuff. So. Uh, I usually I usually turn myself to there, or I go to Chipotle. Chipotle is kind of the other option. We don't have that in Canada, but I know too. I've tried it when I went to San Diego. I was like, I'm gonna try this Chipotle yeah. finally, and I'm like, Ooh, it's 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 pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, spicy food for me. Like I mean, I'm a spicy food enthusiast. So yeah, that's... yeah, I like spicy foods too. Yeah, I, I like wings for sure. Buffalo wings. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a ranch? Okay, let me ask you. So, are you a ranch sauce guy for your wings, or are you a spicy sauce wings? Uh, I like ranch on the side. I like spicy wings. Like, I like a nice uh, like mango habanero or something like that. You know, sweet sweet chili or something. Nice. Good choice. And um, the other thing is, uh, so let me ask you this: if you had to, if you had to pick a day to spend with one legend, Pavel Datsuk or Connor McDavid? <sighs> That's tough. Uh, wow. Um, you know what? I've I've met Pavel Datsuk before. Uh, he's he's a pretty cool guy. But you know what? I I would love to kind of hear what Connor McDavid would have to say about like you know his kind of whole rise up because he he I, I guess he kind of. Um, he had more of a similar experience in terms of youth hockey, you know, playing in the same uh, system as, as I grew up in and, and Datsuk obviously playing more overseas and playing more in the Russian system. So I feel like I'd be able to, you know, somewhat relate mm -hmm. um, to, you know, his, his uh, childhood, but I definitely want to see like how, how, you know, how he excelled and, you know, what, what really made him special. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I like that. I really like that choice since, like, you know, you're both from North America. So that's why. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Here's a good one. This one Montreal bagels or New York bagels? We got to end the debate here. <laughs> bagels. Oh. Oh, I didn't have to end this on bagels. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry, Montreal people, but I, I got to go with the New York bagels. <laughs> 
It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> it's okay. They're going to be like, they're going to say, they're going to say, ah, it's okay. He's allowed. He's allowed. He gets a pass. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but and- I, I do, I do miss the Montreal Bagels. I haven't been there in a while. So honestly, my, my taste might be a bit skewed. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to say New York Bagels because I've had the most recently, but you know, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to Montreal and try myself a Montreal bagel, and, and then I'll be able to give you a good answer. Okay. So when you watch a hockey game, Madison Square Garden or the Montreal or the Bell Center? Hmm. Which environment's crazier? I'm going to give it to the Bell Center. I like watching games in Canada, definitely. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been to a couple of games here, Madison Square Garden, and I love Madison Square Garden, but... The love for hockey is so different in Montreal. Like, there's just a completely different atmosphere, and and I just love that passion from fans in, in Montreal. So I'm I would definitely say Montreal. Awesome, awesome. Well, Nick, um, I really want to say thank you for coming on. You know, to have a guy like you come on, like it, it was really such a big honor. Um, and for you to be on your first podcast, you did amazing. Like you're a natural. I, I, I you know, I, I love this, and I feel like I've been training this for a while. I've been watching my fair share of podcasts, you know, Spitting Chicklets and, and you know, uh, other other podcasts. So I feel like I got a little prepared for this. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to From Failing Hands. They're a Montreal Canadiens podcast, and they're a very right. pro player. And um, the guys, uh, John, Mike, and Murad, have spoken very, very, very highly of your father. And um, they, uh, and uh, if ever your dad is willing to ever get on a show, like uh, they would, that's one show I would, I would really. Chicklets, one thing. From failing yeah. <laughs> hands, it's better if, if he goes on there because that's gonna really give, make Montreal fans appreciate him even more. All right. What 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 what'd you say the podcast was called again? I was trying from, to get that. From failing hands, like you know the saying, okay. saying it from the Bell Center, from failing hands we pass. Oh, the okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to give them a shout out. So um, because they were because like they were the ones when I got into podcasting, they were like because there's there's like two people that really got me into podcasting. There was my friend Emilio who did like it for combat sports, and then these guys for hockey. And when I was figuring out which niche I wanted to do, first it was only martial arts, but then I said, I don't want to be known for one thing. I want people to know that I knew hockey too. So I yeah. wanted that's why I do this show. So it's a mix of both. Yeah, I, you know what I love it. It's 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 original. So uh, it's it's two very different things. Uh, and I mean, you kind of have the fighting aspect kind of lap over, but um, I, you know, I, I love it. It's it's so different. So I'm glad glad to be on here. Did you enjoy? Yeah. Did you have a? Uh, did you have fun? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It's it's not, nothing like I've ever done. I mean, I've I've had a couple of interviews for you know 15, 20 minutes, but never a long uh, talk with you know on a podcast. So I, I definitely enjoyed it because I love having long talks. Me too. Me too, man. Well, it was a pleasure hosting you. Where can people connect with you if they ever want to, like, um, like you know, like just follow you if they want to get hockey advice? Uh, so, I mean, you could definitely follow me on my Instagram page. Uh, well, I don't even know my Instagram that well. Uh, so it's nkovi17, N-K-O-V-I-1-7. Uh, that's my Instagram page. I mean, I obviously have a Twitter page. I, I don't use it all that much, but uh, sometimes I get a bit of news about myself and what I'm doing with my, uh, with my future. So you could definitely follow me on there. And that's at Kobe, the kid, uh, <laughs> which is a little nickname I made uh, for myself when I was, you know, playing video games and, you know, I, uh, I kind of got it from Sid, the kid. And, you know, I, I kind of like the ring with Kobe, the kid. So that's, that's one of the other, um, nicknames I have. So that's K O V I T H E K I D. Nice, nice man. Well, uh, guys, once again, once again, Nick, if you get a thousand follow requests from Montreal fans, um, I'm not responsible, but I'm glad I could play a part. <laughs> hey, <laughs> so, you know, don't blame I'll, me if they I'll start. Like yeah, I don't. Don't blame me. But uh, guys, the episode will be on Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. So when it's up, make sure to like, make sure to to watch it, share, because this kid is going to be a star. Whether in in some for, and he's gonna be a star in the NHL, and even after that, he's gonna use his own brand to become a bigger star in hockey. So watch <laughs> out, guys! Nikita Kovalev, big things, big things. Yep. Again, thank you for having me. Uh, I definitely had such a great time, and you know, uh, I'll, I'll be looking forward to listening to some of these podcasts as well. 
Thanks, man. Thank you.